Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the NC State Computer Science Senior Design Center's Toasters and Pies. This is our end of semester exposition when we celebrate the accomplishments of our fabulous students. So thank you to all of you. My name is Margaret Heil, and I am the director of the Senior Design Center. And you may be asking, what is the Senior Design Center? What do we do here? Well, we house our undergraduate senior capstone course that all of our undergraduates are required to, to take before they graduate. So what they do in this course is they receive a problem statement from sponsors on the first day of class. And our sponsors are mostly industrial sponsors. We do have some university sponsors as well as you'll see here today in the presentation. Then their task is to solve that problem by developing a piece of software during the semester. So today you will hear from 24 of our students as you see on the program. And I promise that they are short and sweet presentations and, and really very, very streamlined and they've been working very, very hard on these. So I promise we'll be out within the hour. So thank you for that. And, and, and after those presentations, we'll go upstairs and you'll get to meet all of the teams and see their posters and their demos. The mission of the Senior Design Center is to help our students to integrate their technical expertise. So they come to us, the students come to us in their last year, right before they graduate. So they come to us with technical skills and we help them in senior design to integrate their technical skills with their professional communication skills. That is their writing, their speaking, their project management, and their teaming. It's a very, very exciting experience. We do this with the help of a very a large teaching team, and I serve as director, and I work with a number of people, and I'd like to thank them now. The assistant director, if you would please stand up when I call your name, that would be wonderful. The assistant director of the center is Dr. Ignacio Dominguez, and he serves as assistant director, <laughs> as well as a technical advisor. Dr. Alexander Card is another technical advisor who started with us this semester. Dr. Jason King is also a technical advisor for us. <laughs> Dr. Amy Allard, who serves as a communications assistant with us in section two. She just began this semester, so thank you to Dr. Allard. <laughs> Dr. Lena Battistelli, who serves as a technical advisor for section three. And Dr. David Sturgill, the technical advisor for section four. And we have four TAs who are absolutely fantastic. They're still working over there in the corner. Sonali and Steven and Arpit and Saksham, thank you so much for all of your help this semester as well as to help organize the event. So thank you so much. I'd also like to thank the sponsors of this event, Amazon and, and the College of Engineering Foundation, as well as the Computer Science ePartners program. Thank you very much. And to Ken Tate and Tammy Coates for all of your help um, with sponsors and with helping to organize this event. And of course, the student ambassadors who you will saw who, who greeted you. So without any further ado, I would like to invite the first presenter to the stage um, to get our show started, Chirag. And I look forward to seeing all of you later. Thank you, Ms. Heil. Hey everyone, my name is Chirag, and I'm here to talk about File Explorer on behalf of my teammates Sumit, Raj, Parikshit, and Zach. Quick shout out to our sponsors, the North Carolina Division of Parks and Recreation. I think we have John, Josh, and Cole here with us today. Thank you so much for coming out. Your support means a lot to us. Um, let me introduce our ex uh, application with an example scenario. There's a new hire at NCDPR, his name is Jim. And his boss asks him for a rundown of all of his clients. Jim has no idea what a rundown is. So he tries to find a past example of one using an existing application at the NCDPR called the e-file. He doesn't really know what these terms mean. He hits search anyway, but he can't find the file. And instead, he sees the SQL query that is of no relevance to him. He tries to use another app at, a, at the NCDPR to file, find this file and gets the same result. 
So Jim still does not know what a rundown is, and his job depends on it. So he goes to John, the database manager at NCDPR, and John has had to do this for a lot of new hires before, and he does not want to once again manually search through the database. So he comes to us folks at the Senior Design Center, and what do we do for him? We build File Explorer with an X, because we're innovative that way. Um, and what File Explorer does is it takes these three slightly different file management applications that are a little outdated and hard to use, and it combines them into one modern application which simplifies the search interface and then streamlines the organizational metadata related to files. So when Jim wants to look for a rundown, all he has to do is enter a keyword, select some filters, and voila, he has his rundown. Now, how does our application work? There's an Nginx reverse proxy that sits between the user and the front end, which is written in React.js. The front end takes the, the info from the user, which is usually files and related metadata, and passes it to the back end, which is written in slim PHP. And this is where all the logic lies for uploading, searching, and downloading files. And this back end persists these files in an AWS S3 bucket, and then stores references to them in our own MariaDB database, along with the additional metadata that we talked about. Then there's the legacy system that has always existed and will continue to function off of the same database so that both our systems can run in parallel with each other. Unfortunately, that's all the time I have for now. But if you want to know more about our application or if you want to know what a rundown is, please come check us out upstairs. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll hand it off to Allison from the other NC Parks team. Thank you, Chirag. Hi, everyone. My name is Allison, and I worked with Alex, Matthew, Shruti, and Quentin this semester on a visitation application, also sponsored by the North Carolina Division of Parks and Recreation. We would like to give a big thank you to our sponsors for being here today. Many of, all, many of you all have probably been to one of North Carolina's 41 state parks. I've been to 11 myself. In fact, since the start of the pandemic, the state parks have seen a significant increase in park attendance and had a record 22.8 million visitors in 2021. So NC Parks Direct needs to track attendance to the state parks for funding and planning purposes. To do so, they have a number of IoT devices located at park entrances and trailheads. Currently, park staff then take the data that's recorded by the devices and manually input it into an existing visitation application to keep track of and see trends in park attendance. However, the existing application is outdated, and this process of manual data entry is tedious and doesn't utilize the full capabilities of the IoT devices. The devices do upload their data to a third-party cloud server called DBDOTS. However, UBDOTS currently lacks a connection to the existing visitation application. So, to address these issues, NC Parks and Rec asked our team to create an updated visitation application that could connect to and receive data from UBDOTS. Taking a look at our application's updated design, device and visitation data is stored in a MariaDB database. Our application's backend is written in PHP and follows a slim framework and provides functionality surrounding device and visitation data. And our application's front end is written in React.js and uses the Apex Charts library to display a dashboard of visitation data trends. These elements compose our application's updated design. However, we also needed to create a connection between our application and UBDOTS to facilitate the automatic transfer of visitation data. So to do that, our team created a webhook that's hosted on the UB.Dots server and listens for devices to upload their data to UB.Dots hourly. When this happens, it will call an event that will trigger, uh, it will trigger an event to call a post request to our application's API endpoints, sending the visitation data in a JSON object for our application to handle. If you'd like to see our visitation dashboard and the rest of our application, then come take a hike upstairs. Next up is Taha. Thank you, Allison. Hi, everyone. I'm Taha, and I worked with Hans, Henry, Chase, and Stephen on the Computer Vision Pipeline portal. Our sponsor was the Cigar Lab, and we'd like to give a big thanks to Dr. Roberts for all of his help throughout the semester. So the human eye is pretty incredible, and computer scientists are currently working on making computer vision just as incredible. It has many applications, from detecting people and everyday objects in pictures to analyzing a microscopic scan. The Cigar Lab at NC State is doing research on dogs, and specifically how those dogs communicate with their handlers. Part of that research involves tracking the position and movement of the dog's tail, and the Cigar Lab would like to use computer vision to solve this problem. Unfortunately, computer vision is complicated. 
and researchers without technical knowledge might not have the requisite skills to write, build, and run the code necessary. That's where our computer vision pipeline portal comes into play. It allows the user to use simple drag and drop controls to build and run this pipeline. The process starts by dropping in some input data. In our example, a picture of a dog. Next, the user can drop in a pre-processing step. Maybe they want to convert the picture to black and white. Finally, they drop in a step that runs a vision model. In our example, the vision model will find the position of the dog's tail and annotate the image accordingly. However, the input doesn't have to be just one file. You can provide it a set of files, say, a series of frames in a video, and the output will be the position of the dog's tail over time. This web app was built with React in the front end using Apache as a reverse proxy. The drag and drop interface uses a JavaScript library called D3. In the back end, we're using Django and Python to handle HTTP requests, as well as MariaDB for our database and Minio for file storage. Minio is S3 compatible, so we can easily modify this to store the files in the cloud rather than locally. And the final component of our app is the task manager, Celery. Celery will spin up a Docker container for every step in the pipeline, run the code in that container, and then return the results to the back end. Now, the Cigar Lab can better understand the dogs that they research. Uh, and if you want to check out our pipeline, uh, check out our demo upstairs. Thanks for your time. And I'd like to turn it over to Brendan now. Thank you, Taha. Ahoy, mateys. My name is Brendan, and I'll be your presenter for today. There I am up there. I've been on the Money Making Mateys team this semester, and I've been able to work alongside Tyler, Timothy, Jaron, and Josetha. I'd like to give a big thanks to our sponsors, Katabasis, Bill, Jorge, and Joseph. How many of you entered your adult life with confidence in your financial skills? Maybe you know somebody who graduated high school and didn't know how loans work or couldn't manage a budget. These topics are not often taught in schools, especially in underserved communities. Now imagine you're back in middle school. I know, the horror. How would you go about learning these financial concepts? Well, that's where Katabasis comes in, as they uh, specialize in educational games for kids in low-income communities. They tasked us with Money Making Mateys, an educational game for kids full of the wonderful metaphors that make you learn things under the guise of being fun and exciting. We have islands, representing the options in life. Swabies, representing the time you can allocate. Mateys, representing money. An enemy, representing your expenses. And lastly, a sea god, giving you out loans. As a player plays our games, they'll be capturing islands, causing them to manage their assets, income, and expenses, and even making sure that their work-life balance keeps their morale up. The aforementioned sea god gives the player loans, which function in-game just like they do in real life. Lastly, we've implemented a tutorial to aid in the learning process. Throughout the semester, we've been doing usability testing. These were of the think aloud type while the player narrates their thoughts. We tested on children in the target age group of late middle to early high school, as well as adults in the financial industry. As this is an educational game, it was vital that our game was intuitive, easy to use, and most importantly, that those financial concepts came across. Through this testing, we found out our game had visibility issues, so we improved the user interface. Players were reporting that it was unclear when expenses were happening, so we added pop-ups. Lastly, those financial concepts just weren't coming across, so we've implemented that tutorial to smooth out that process. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to check out our demo, come on upstairs. Once again, thank you to Katavasis, and now I'll hand it over to Samantha. Thank you, Brennan. Hello, I'm Samantha Ferrero, and alongside my team, Randy, Rishi, and Dalming, we worked on the other Catavasis team, the Game Logger. I would like to thank our sponsors, Bill, Joseph, and Jorge, who are back there. So, Brendan, you're our sister team, so what about you come up here and you help me present? Well, thank you. So, as you heard, Catavasis is a company that makes games, and they have a couple of games that teach you different things. For example, financial literacy, coding, and resource management. And in these games, there's a lot of things that people have to take, keep track of, like scores, level start times, level end times, what buttons were clicked, items used, and a lot more. So Catavasis came to us and they said, we need a logger. And this logger needs to be made in C-sharp. It also need, we need a website with graphs that together they can collect and show the data of the playthroughs so we can later reference them. 
So my team and I came up with a design. It is basically three portions. The first one is a caddy proxy that contains our front end and our back end. The front end is written in React.js, and it's a simple website. The back end is made on Node.js, and it communicates through REST API. It also communicates with the second part of a project, a database. The database is written in MySQL, and it contains all of the necessary information that we need to maintain. On the other side, we have the games. Each game is made in Unity, and inside of each game, we put our logger, which is a dynamically lean library that can be added to any of these games. So how will this help Catavasis? Well, the teachers will be able to measure their students' progress by looking at the data that they received while playing. And the managers will be able to take this data and see if there's anything that needs to be changed in the games themselves. So now I welcome you to come up to our demo later and play a game, Agricoding, and see your own data as it shows up on the screen. Thank you very much, and I should pass it over to Justin from Salesforce. Thank you, Samantha. Good morning, everyone. My name is Justin, here representing Team 12 Salesforce with our project on dynamic schemas in GraphQL. I had a pleasure working with Yunfei, Chen, Jim, and Henry throughout the semester. I'd also like to give a special thank you to our sponsors, Stephen and Paul, for their continuous support throughout this project. So who is Salesforce? Well, Salesforce is the world's number one customer relationship management platform, or CRM for short, and they help other companies connect with their customers through providing useful data. But what's the technology that allows Salesforce to do this? Well, as you might have already guessed from the title, it's through a popular data query language called GraphQL. However, GraphQL currently has its limitations, and let me break it down for you. So whenever a client wants to request data from the database using GraphQL, it must first send a query to the GraphQL server that has a schema, which is a blueprint of how the data is organized in the database so that the server can get the exact data the client wants from the database. However, the problem is that the schema is static, meaning that it must be in sync with the database. So whenever the database gets updated, the schema must also be updated and be redistributed to the client. Now, this is not problematic for just one or few clients, but in the real world, Salesforce has millions of clients, so this redistribution is too costly and time-consuming. So this is where we come in. Our goal for this project was to implement a dynamic type schema that can be used to represent different types of data so that whenever the database gets updated, there is no need for the schema to be updated and be redistributed to the client. And this new schema should work as efficiently as its static counterpart. So we came up with two approaches to implement this dynamic type schema. In our first approach, which we call the dynamic resolver approach, we modify the resolver function, which usually fetches only one type of data so that it can now fetch different types of data from the database. In our second approach, which we call the query transformation approach, we added the transformer function um, that can accept a dynamic query from the client and convert it into a more simplified static query that the GraphQL can handle. And we tested the performance of each approach and have compiled our results onto our poster. So we invite you to come upstairs to visit our poster to learn more about them and how they compare. Thank you very much. And now I would like to hand it over to Mikey. All right, hi everyone, thank you Justin. My name is Mikey Donahue and I'm representing Team 13 SAS1 with the Optimal EV Charger Placement Project. So before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to thank my teammates David, Zach, Joel, and Jay for the awesome hard work they've put in this semester. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors from SAS for giving us fantastic feedback each week. We really couldn't have done it without them. So with that in mind, let's get right into it. So North Carolina has a problem. You see, in the more urban areas like Raleigh, EV charger density is super high. But if you go to the more rural or ex-urban regions of North Carolina, that EV charger density drops off tremendously, which makes sense, but it poses a problem for increasing EV adoption. So, SAS decided to partner up with energy utilities like Duke Energy and come up with a solution for this. They said that if we can increase E the access to EV chargers across the state, we can then increase EV adoption itself, which is great, that's the end goal here. 
With this in mind, SAS gave us a problem statement. Basically, they told us to make an application that allows a user to look at a map of the road network of North Carolina and find the best road segments to put EV chargers on. In response, we came up with a high-level design to address this. We, our vision was, if you're a user that wants to use this application, you're gonna go to our website whose front end will present you with a map and some report generating capability. When you go to generate this report, the front end is gonna send a, a, an API request to the back end. The back end's gonna take a look at this API request and take out some details from it and get road data from a MySQL database. The back end's gonna then take that road data and pass it to our underlying algorithms, which are gonna run some math on it and do the heavy lifting here. From there, it's gonna return the best road segments in North Carolina to the end user so they can see it nice and neatly on the map. So that's all fine and good, but I wanna take a moment to talk about these algorithms here because they really were the meat of this project. So we came up with a discrete approach to this problem. Basically what we do is we take the road network of North Carolina and then we turn it into a graph where each vertex represents a road segment and each edge represents the connectivity between that and the other road segments. From there, we assign each, each vertex a score. Now, this score en en encompasses a lot of things. Basically, just numerical values of the features of that vertex and the other features of the other road segments in the road network. From there, we take the top end scores and return them to the end user so they can see the best road segments in North Carolina. So with that in mind, I'm sure you guys are very excited to mess around with our application a little bit, so I encourage you to do so. Come on upstairs so you too can plan out North Carolina's future EV charging infrastructure. Thank you. And up next is Michael. Thank you, Mikey, for the introduction. My name is Michael Dakenai, and I'm representing the Game to Learn Lab at NC State. I had a pleasure of working with my teammates, Brandon, Trent, Jackson, and Patrick this semester, and I'd like to thank our mentoring sponsors, Dr. Nick Lytle and Ali Limke, for their help. So who here wants to learn to code? Hopefully we have a lot of hands up. So Snap is a very popular visual drag and drop based programming language that's used in K-12 classrooms around the country. In fact, when I was in high school, I coded up this game, Centipede, for the final project in my AP Computer Science Principles class. So if we have Snap, what is Snap class? The Game to Learn Lab takes Snap as a base and adds enhanced features uh, that adapt it to the physical classroom. And we were handed this project at the beginning of the semester, and so far we've implement, implemented many features, including a virtual hand raising feature, student assignment auto saving, as well as peer and self reviews. Now I'll give a brief overview of the high level design. So our first block is Snap, or more specifically, the Snap API. The second block is a backend built in Node.js that will connect with the Snap API for authentication, code saving, and much more. And the third building block is a front end built in Angular. The Snap API is embedded into the front end so that the coding interface is the same that users know and love. And finally, all that student and teacher data is sent to the back end and then inserted into our local database built in MySQL. Now I'll go over the low level design for one of the use cases that we did, hand raising. So here's a front end view. We have John, a student, and he's in an AP Computer Science Principles class. Right now he's taking assignment one, recursion, but he's having a little trouble. He needs to ask the teacher for help. So on the assignment page, there's a hand icon, and he clicks that, which adds him to the help queue. Now he's second in line, the teacher view then checks the help queue. If it's changed, it will update the teacher's page, and now that will alert the teacher with a ding. Thank you so much for watching this presentation. Please visit upstairs, and I'd like to pass it on to Joe. Thank you so much, Michael. That was fantastic. Hello, my name is Joseph Anderson, and I'll be representing the Laboratory for Analytic Sciences, along with Daniel, Alone, Simon, and Kaylee. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors. They've been absolutely fantastic to work with. So before I begin in full, I'd like to open up the topic about how machines learn. Look, oh my gosh, I didn't realize this was actually gonna come up. Uh, my clicker can quickly work through this. I hate all these stupid traffic questions. Hurry, hurry, hurry. We're good. 
Okay, so before I was rudely interrupted, I was just about to open up the topic about how machines learn, and funny enough, you actually just witnessed it. Machines learn by digesting large quantities of human-verified answers to abstract concepts, so they can pick up on things like pattern recognition. You know, okay, great, so all those surveys we do actually mean something. But what about when we need to ask more complicated questions than a CAPTCHA could answer? For that, LAS introduces their own program, Infinity Pool. And with it, we can send more complicated surveys to human-employed labelers. These surveys can include questions like draw boxes around specific parts of the images. Okay, great, you know, that's much better for machine learning, but we come into a problem when a human is handed a job that's just honestly way too tedious for them. When that happens, it can just cause the human to phone in their answers and lead to lower quality data, and it's just a bad time for everybody involved. Nobody wants to do this. So to fix this, LAS commissioned us, and our solution to this is to take the human out of the direct workflow and instead put in pre-existing AI. Now, they may not be perfect, but they can do a pretty good job at getting a mostly correct answer to these tedious questions, and then it's just the human's job to uh, correct it wherever they're wrong or pass it off if it's correct. So let's take a look at the program workflow. This is what we were originally handed, and here are our new changes supporting that AI feedback. And lastly, here are some of the technologies that help support this. So to start, a project manager is gonna create a brand new survey and decide which questions they wanna send with it. They'll then bulk load all of the data associated with each question, but now we're sending those questions and their data to new external AI, who will then, for each piece of data, give their best approximate answer to it which is then returned to the original program, and the entire survey is stored in the database until a human is ready to assess it. And when they are ready to assess it, the surveys they are sent already feature the partially correct AI answers, and it's their job to just correct it wherever it's mistaken, and then that final human feedback is stored back in the database as final answers. Now, if you'd like to see this, we encourage you to come upstairs where we have an AI answering the age-old question, is it a chihuahua or a muffin? It's hilarious to look at, and I'm sure you'll get a kick out of it, but thank you so much for listening, and now here's Ben. Thanks, man. Thank you, Joseph. So, I like to cook, but I just walked into my pantry, and it looks a lot like this. It's really messy, but I'm sure the ingredients that I need for my recipe are in here somewhere. If only I had somebody like my dad to come along and clean it up for me to make it look a little more like this. Now I can find exactly what I'm looking for. Hi, I'm Ben, and I work with my teammates, Jesse, Victoria, Caleb, and Pepper this semester uh, on our project Goza Reimagined, where we did this exact same thing for our sponsor, SAS. I'd like to thank our sponsors really quick, and then uh, we're gonna go ahead and find out what exactly is in SAS's pantry. Well, SAS has an existing web application called Gozer, and they use Gozer to view software testing results. These results include things like software builds, individual tests, as well as UI benchmarks. But there's a big problem. SAS does a lot of testing, so there's a lot of this data. And just like our pantry, it's hard for SAS employees to find exactly what they're looking for efficiently. So this is where we came in. SAS asked us this semester to redesign the Gozer UI to focus more on usability and scalability. So to do this, we first split these different pieces of data across three separate views. Then within each of these views, we focus on creating new designs, adding additional features like sorting and filtering, and addressing scalability concerns. That's what we did, but here's how we did it. We first created a React front end, and this React front end makes use of the Chakra UI and React router libraries. Our front end communicates with a back end Node.js server that functions as our REST API. And this, uh, this back end server communicates with our MongoDB database where our sample data from SAS is stored. Of course, since our project is focused on usability, we had to uh, perform multiple rounds of usability testing to ensure that our UI was the best we could deliver. So, as you can see, uh, the, second bar, the blue bar uh, represents our, re our results from our second round of testing, and it seems like we, the improvements we made between our first and second rounds of testing uh, did improve the UI. So if you'd like to see our uh, new UI for SAS and come check it out yourself, you can come uh, check, us, check our poster out upstairs. Uh, thank you for your time, and I'd like to introduce the next presenter, Claire. Thank you, Ben. Hi everyone, my name is Claire Davis. I am the Team 8 presenter with AR Protein Dynamics. My team is Austin, Amanda, and Subhashini, and our sponsors are Dr. David Roberts from NC State University and Dr. Candace Roberts from Wake Tech Community College. 
So I'd like to direct your attention to the screen. What you see is a ribbon diagram of a protein molecule. This model is often used in upper-level biology classes to help teach students about the structure of molecules. However, as a biology professor at Wake Tech Community College, Dr. Candace Roberts noticed that students were often having a hard time understanding this model because it is a, it is a 2D representation of a complex 3D object. To make things even more complicated, different environmental factors such as temperature and pressure can change the structure of these molecules. So my team and I are working on an augmented reality application to help bring this 2D representation into the 3D realm. So augmented reality is a real-time combination of the digital and physical worlds with 3D object identification, generally using the camera on your phone screen. So let's say you're looking at this beautiful lake. You take your phone out and you point your camera at the lake. The augmented reality application will identify the lake and put a Loch Ness Monster on it. Another real life example of this is Pokemon Go. So let's talk some more about our application. We have three different user types, students, instructors, and admin. Students are able to view the molecules in the augmented reality view. Instructors can manage the molecules and environmental factors, as well as define lesson plans for the students to follow along in. And the admin are responsible for managing the users. To go into some more detail, we have a React front end that sends requests through an Nginx reverse proxy to our Spring Boot backend that's written in Java. This backend then sends a request to a MySQL server, which packages the requested objects and sends them back up through to the front end. All of these applications are written inside Docker containers for scalability and ease of development. So come see our poster if you want to explore our AR view. Come see molecules come alive on your own phone and follow along in an instructor to find lesson plan. I'd like to thank the sponsors and the teaching staff for their time, or for their support, you all for your time. And up next is Neil. Hey everyone, my name is Neil. I'll be talking about managing big data in AWS. First, I work with Ankit, Braden, Dev, and Zach, and a huge shout out to our sponsors, LAS. Now let's get right into it. Meet Ankit Krishna, a current senior in computer science, and he has to read 10,000 lines of code. So what's the easiest way you can do this? Clones. Could you imagine having one, but two, but three versions of the shelf, ladies and gentlemen? That'd make life so much easier. But sadly, this is impossible. But you know what can do this? Computers. Computers are able to have multi multiple versions of themselves and tackle one problem. This is where a programming paradigm called MapReduce comes into play. It is exactly that. And, Amazon, and we use that Amazon's version, Elastic MapReduce. Yes, Amazon. Not Amazon Prime, but Amazon AWS. So how does LAS incorporate this? So LAS has an internal website called AWS Commander, just like NCOC Moodle, and that interfaces with the AWS API and gets all that information. Currently, LAS has two services, Amazon EC2 and Amazon SageMaker. We added a third called Amazon EMR, or Amazon Elastic MapReduce. So how does this work? In the front end, you add all the information, like the name and types of EMR. After that, it connects to the REST API and processes that information with JSON and then sends it to the back end. And once it's in the back end is where all the magic happens. That is where it sends it to the Amazon Cloud and actually creates the EMR instance. Simultaneously, it then stores in the back end, or stores in the database, sorry, but for ease of access and caching. And yeah, I know you guys would love to hear more about this and more about clones, so please come visit us at the booth upstairs. Now, Keshav. Thank you, Neil. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is my name is Keshav Shreeder, and I'm on Team Four along with Ravant, Jack, Mohammed, and Vin. This semester, we worked on a poultry blood work reporting tool for the College of Veterinary Medicine and Department of Computer Science. I want to give a huge thank you to our sponsors, Dr. Crespo and Dr. Roberts, for their help throughout the semester. The College of Veterinary Medicine collects blood work samples from their flocks of chickens and turkeys across multiple farms. And using this data, they calculate healthy ranges, which serve as expected intervals for each of their blood work analytes. For example, a young male healthy chicken should have a blood glucose level between 180 and 350. They can perform diagnostic samples on chickens whose health is unknown and compare this data to the healthy ranges to determine whether the chicken is healthy or not. 
The current process the college uses to do this involves manually entering data into an access database, executing queries to export the data to Excel, and running Excel macros to calculate the healthy ranges. This process is time intensive, prone to human error, and lacks inter-organization collaboration. Our solution is a web application which serves as a one-stop shop for poultry blood work input, analysis, validation, and organization management. Data collectors can input blood work samples into the system which must be validated by a supervisor in their organization. The system also calculates healthy ranges for each bird's species, gender, and age group. PDF reports can also be generated for samples to see how the data stacks up against the healthy ranges. The benefits of our application include reduced human error and reduced human work time, and inter-organization collaboration also allows for more blood work samples to be aggregated into our system, which creates more accurate and narrow healthy ranges that can be shared across organizations. Now let's talk about our system architecture, which was inherited from a team last semester. We are using a React JavaScript front end and a Python back end. The back end uses the Flask API framework and a SQL Alchemy ORM to communicate with the MySQL database. The Nginx reverse proxy is used to facilitate communication between the user, front end, and back end. Each component in our design is hosted in a Docker container. This semester, we worked on low-level de design changes, such as redesigning the database schema, redesigning new API endpoints, and redesigning old API endpoints. Please come see us upstairs to try out our demo and perform some poultry blood work analysis. Thank you. And now I'm going to hand it off to Matthew. Hey. Thank you, Keisha. Hello, folks. My name is Matthew, and I'm representing Team 9 Geoquake. My teammates are Benson, Sean, Alex, and Neil, and I'd like to give a special thanks to our sponsor, Dr. Ashley Cavis from Geoquake. And so when I was a child, I was cute and I was active. I liked to climb on everything, trees, shelves, fences, you name it. And as I grew up I, uh, older, I didn't stop climbing. I just climbed on other things, specifically rock climbing. Now, rock climbing is a very technical sport that requires a lot of support and equipment. And unfortunately for a beginner like me, it's kind of hard to figure out what you need exactly. Now, fortunately, there is a great community of experienced rock climbers who can share their knowledge and know-how with somebody, uh, beginners like me. Unfortunately, not everybody benefits from this community. In South America, they experience a disproportionate amount of seismic activity, and yet Hispanics and Latins only make up to 8% of the STEM workforce. Our sponsor, Dr. Ashley Cabas, decided to do something about this through our communication web platform, Escala, or the uh, Earthquake Engineering and Seismology Community Alliance in Latin America. Now, Escala means to climb, and through our web platform, we hope to bring the community of earthquake engineers to a new level. Now, we are the phase two implementation of our project. In the, uh, phase two, we worked on community pages, listserv functionalities, uh, filter member searches, Twitter feeds, as well as computer translation for content. Our design uses WordPress and PHP for the front end, as well as the back end. And in our back end, we have third-party plugins to cover some of our functionalities, as well as some custom plugins we wrote to cover uh, ones that didn't, weren't covered by third parties. And all of our content is stored in our MySQL database. Now, let's focus in on one of the uh, functions we did uh, custom build, uh, the listserv functionality. It's built using PHP, CSS, and HTML. And the way it works is that if a user wants to send an email to a group, he first uh, accesses the listserv plugin, which queries our database and gets all the groups that he can send an email to. It returns the list of e uh, groups to the user who selects the groups that he wants to send an email to, passes it back to the listserv plugin, which queries the database for the emails in those groups, and then passes it back to the user for uh, them to write their email. And if you want to learn more about our listserv function or any of our other community functions, climb on out of your seats and join us upstairs at the Escala table. Now I'll pass it on to Gray. Thanks, Matthew. I'm going to start this off with a question. What if I gave you the completed code for a website and I asked you to put that website on the web so that if I typed in a web address, it would come up on my screen? Where would you even start when trying to figure out how to do something like that? And how long do you think it would take you? Our sponsor's bandwidth approached us with a similar issue. 
Bandwidth is a Raleigh-based company that makes programmable interfaces for different types of communication, like automated messaging and even emergency services. Their developers were deploying code to AWS or Amazon Web Services. The problem with this is that AWS is an immensely complicated service, and not all developers have the required knowledge or certifications to properly understand and utilize the service. This could lead to both productivity drains and security vulnerabilities for bandwidth. This past semester, along with my teammates, Joey, Jacob, and Mikey, we created a solution to this issue that we call Hermes. I'd also like to extend a big thanks to our sponsors for all the help that they gave us this previous semester. The idea behind Hermes was to create a drag and drop user interface that would abstract away real AWS elements like EC2 and RDS and replace them with easy to understand blocks like web server and database. We'd also abstract away the connections between these elements and replace it with easy to understand edges that could be dragged between blocks. In this way, bandwidth developers could create and configure entire web de deployments without ever having to worry about the underlying AWS details. Behind the scenes, the bandwidth developer would be interacting with our front end which would allow them to both save diagrams to their local computer and also load previously created diagrams into our UI. Once they're happy with their configuration, they could hit the export button, which would send their diagram over to the back end. Once at the back end, that diagram would be validated and then converted into an executable script that would be returned back to the user. When the user executes this script, all of the elements that they created and configured in our user interface will be deployed to the real AWS cloud. If you'd like to play around and make your own configurations or just learn more about how this all works, feel free to visit us at our poster. Thank you, and now here's Mikado. There you go. Hi, my name is Makeda Lewang. I'm part of Team 22, working alongside of LexisNexis. I want to thank my teammates for being here, Nishan, Rohan, Alex, and Nicholas, and especially to our sponsors, Sean and Steven, joining us online. We could not have done this project without you. Now, let me take you through a scenario. Here's Rohan and here's Alex. They meet each other at a networking event and they start hitting it off. They talk about how they love football, love tacos, and they love the office. But they, and they decide to become friends but they break rule number one at a networking event. They don't exchange each other's contact details. So Rohan gets to work. He goes on the networking events participants page, finds Alex, types in his contact details into a contact card, and texts him. But to no avail, he's getting no text back. What's going on? And so he finds that he typed in the phone number field wrong into the contact card. We are, we are working alongside a LexisNexis interaction team which maintains a customer relationship management platform. And our users consist of law firms and business development partners that work, and, which helps, uh, and this platform helps them work alongside their clients. Their current problem and their biggest problem right now is that the creation of contact cards is too long, too inefficient, and too prone to user error. So as Team 22, our solution was to create an application that would help them parse contact details automatically and create a contact card for them. Here's how it would work. Let's take a phrase such as, hello, Alex. Our parser will specify the Alex name, see that it's a name, assign it to a name field, and place it into a contact card. This will include other fields such as phone, email, address, organization that have similar methods of parsing. Here's a, and looking at our design, uh, we have a React front end that acquires contact data on a web page. This will be then sent to our back end Flask server, which parses that contact data and creates a contact card from it. This contact card is sent back to our front end, and so the user can edit any fields that they see deemed necessary. And once the user is finished and uh, is satisfied with their contact card, they can save it to our interaction database, which uses GraphQL. If you'd like to see more about our project and create some contact cards from yourselves, and if you're some staff here, create contact cards of yourself, please come upstairs and see our demo. Thank you. And now I hand it off to Ashley. Sweet. Thank you, Mikado. My name is Ashlyn Chapman, and this semester I built a real-time telemetry dashboard with my teammates Ian, Cameron, and Olivia. Big thanks to our sponsors Justin and Axel and Dr. Dominguez for your guidance throughout this semester. So unlike all the other teams here, they were sponsored by a company. We were sponsored by an NC State student-run organization called PAC Motorsports. Now this is a club where students get together every year and build a Formula SAE race car from scratch, and then they race it. This past year they placed sixth, and the year before they placed second, nationally. 
So how do they build a car that looks this good and performs so well? Well, a big part of it comes down to getting real-time data from the car components. This is crucial when they're designing and building to make sure the co components are all aligned perfectly. And this is also important when they're racing. So the crew can focus on the performance of the car and the driver can focus on the racetrack. Unfortunately, PAC Motorsports faces two main issues with their out-of-the-box visualization tools, the first of which being a slow refresh rate and the second being a lack of customization. So there's a serious delay between when the car generates data and when the users can visualize that data on their laptops. The second thing is they're collecting various types of data from their car components, but they don't have the tools to be able to see the data. For instance, they have all the GPS locations of the car, but they can't even see the car on the racetrack. To address these issues, we decided to build a solution from the ground up. First thing we focused on was getting the data from the car. We use Mosquito, an MQTT broker, to get the raw data and format it in something our system could use. Then we use Telegraph to store this data in InfluxDB, our real-time database, and also to send the data to our, web our WebSocket server. Now, this is part of our push architecture, so as soon as a new piece of data is accessible, it's immediately sent to our front end. Our front end, our visualization dashboard, is built using ReactJS for the web components and Plotly for our visualization tools. Additionally, we built a REST API server using Flask, and this handles the user configuration files so multiple users can all have their own customized dashboard. The final aspect of this project is that only one PAC Motorsports crew member needs to run it at a time. Everyone else can simply connect over Wi-Fi and have access to all of the data. So if you have any questions on how PAC Motorsports build a race car each year, how we handle real-time telemetry data, or you want to build your own dashboard, come visit us to the far left upstairs. Next up is Kevin. Thank you, Ashlyn. Hello, everybody. My name is Kevin Childs, and I'm going to be presenting our project, CyberQuery, on behalf of my team, Jack, Raven, Amir, and Henry. I also want to give a big shout out to Mike and Ranga from Cisco for being here today and being there every step of the way. Now, imagine the year is 1984. You and a couple of your buddies from Stanford get together and create a networking solution. Before you know it, you have a company called Cisco. When Cisco was started, they had a priority of creating a financially stable product and something that was reliable, that people wanted to use and trusted. Now the year is 2022. Cybersecurity is one of the industry's top priorities, but they still have to maintain performance and that financial stability. So how do they do this when they maintain 50,000 enterprise servers? Each one of these servers needs to have vulnerability analysis, CIS benchmarking, and host monitoring. For that, all that information then needs to be shared with the admins. Scaling this up, though, it becomes a little bit complex to maintain. That's where CyberQuery comes into play. For CyberQuery, it is able to take in data from a tool called OSQuery, process that in the packaged results that is then shared with each of the admin. Scaling this up, it becomes simple and easy to use. Additionally, each device only is running one tool opposed to three, which helps with the performance. The simplicity of the design is more financially um, manageable to maintain. And lastly, since there's less points of failure, it's more secure. Now, what goes on within this CyberQuery server? First, that data from that OS query tool comes in and is stored in our SQL database. Then select information is pulled out and processed into a uh, software bill of materials through our Siphon tool. Then that SBOM is passed into Gripe, which creates vulnerability analysis reports that are shared back with the database. On the other end, we have our CIS benchmarking. Similarly, select information is pulled out, processed into a report, and sent back into the database. Finally, all of this can be viewed via our front end. If you want to see that front end, see our Raspberry Pi server setup, and see how we're going to turn this into an open source project, I invite you to come upstairs after these presentations and check out the blue poster. Now I'm going to pass it off to Jack. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, I'm Jacques Lenoir. I'm here with my teammates, Tyler, Robbie, Gilly, and Harini, and I'm here to talk to you about our AI waste classification system. So first, I'd like to talk about our sponsors, Dr. Paul from the College of Natural Resources. He's working with Dr. Singh and Mr. Joschuk from IBM. Together, they're working on a project to go ahead and deal with this. I mean, look at all that trash. There's 150 million tons of waste going to US landfills each year. Just imagine how much of this we can actually recycle and reuse. This is exactly what our sponsors have sought out to accomplish. 
So they've created an AI that can go ahead and recognize all the trash going into the landfills. However, it doesn't know what it is. It can only, it can only identify, or it can only recognize the trash. It can't identify it. This is what our project is sought out to accomplish. We've created a label system that can go ahead and train the system to do that. First, we get images from the actual system itself, and then we send it to our database. In this database, this is the IBM Cloud Object Storage. From here, we can pull the images to our back end. Our back end is using Node.js, and we can then send those images to the front end, which is React.js. This is where all of our domain experts are gonna be interacting with. These people know what's in the trash, and they can identify and label it with our system. These labels are then gonna be going back to the front end, back to the back end, and then they're gonna be going into another database. This is IBM's CloudInt database. From there, you can send these labels to the AI itself, where, so it can train. That way, it can actually start better recognizing and identifying these uh, individual pieces of trash. We can then, instead of the image going to the database, we can send the image to the AI itself, and it can annotate it and send it to some front-end waste management workers. These workers have, uh, um, sorry, augmented reality glasses that they can use to see and pick out the trash from the conveyors itself. So eventually, instead of just being able to recognize the trash that's going down the conveyor belt, our AI is gonna be able to identify everything, and eventually we can, re we can recover and, and recycle a lot more from it. So if you'd like to become your own domain expert and try and label things yourself, why don't you come check us out? Next, I'll pass it off to Nicole. Thanks, Jack. Hey everyone, I'm Nicole, and along with my teammates, Lily, Danny, Christian, and Pravo, this semester we've been working with Positive Hire. Thank you to our sponsors, Michelle, Haley, and Arthur. We've been working with them this semester on our analytics dashboard, PH Balanced. At the beginning of the semester, our sponsors gave us HR data, a lot of HR data. But this doesn't show us the things that we need to see from this data. It doesn't show us that in the STEM workforce, only 34% of employees are women. It doesn't show us that from that percentage, only 11.3% are minority women. And from that percentage, only 4.3% are black, indigenous, or Latina women. It also doesn't show us that of these women in STEM, 56% are choosing to leave their careers in the middle of it. And this is a problem. We need to find ways to retain these experienced professionals and companies aren't sure how to do that. So how do we? Well, part of the solution is our analytics dashboard, PH Balanced. PH Balanced uses representation, hiring, retention and attrition data in order to generate charts that companies can then use to identify areas that they need to improve to keep these women. So how exactly does it work? Well, a company has employee records, lots of employee records. These employee records are put into a database and from that database we generate data that is used to generate charts. I'm going to introduce you to one of our sponsors, Michelle. Hi, Michelle. She would like to view a hiring chart for a company that she's working with. So she's gonna go to our front-end application, which is built with React, Bootstrap, and Google Charts. That front-end application is gonna interact with the back-end application, which includes the chart and employee services and the associated objects. That back-end is gonna send a request to our SQL database, which is hosted in AWS. And the database is going to return the requested data. The back-end will convert it into what the front-end needs to create and show the chart. So if you're interested in seeing some data trends for yourself, come see us upstairs. And I'm gonna pass off to Micah now. Thank you, Nicole. My name is Micah McLean, and along with my team, Hadi, Leo, Matthew, and Griffin, we got to work with Volunteer this semester. I'd like to give a big thanks to our sponsor, Oliver. Are y'all ready for snow this year? I think it's gonna snow but it just might look a little bit more like this here in North Carolina. This semester, I got to think a lot about snow because we worked with Snowflake, but more about that later. Volunteer is a big company with six subsidiary companies all in the automotive industry, and that means that they have a lot of financial data, and that data takes a lot of time to analyze. Our solution was that we created three financial dashboards. The first financial dashboard would show basic financial information by month, type, or department. The second shows financial data by forecast versus actual, budget versus actual. And then the third gives a closer view into the data, looking at specific departments. Let's go into our system design. 
To start off, we get the data from Volunteers Data Hub. That data then goes into our uh, Snowflake database. We chose Snowflake because it's a cloud-based industrial strength um, database with near infinite data storage and near infinite compute resources. Within Snowflake, we then take the data and we create views using SQL queries. These views clean up the data and help us to aggregate it together. We then push that data into Power BI. Power BI helps us to visualize the data in an intuitive and simple way. We also add some more data ag aggregation using DAX expressions. These expressions allow us to show fields like percentage of total expense. Through this semester, we also got to do some test data through Python. We created a job application that inserts data directly into a database. Now, that's currently running with MySQL, but the ideal is that that would directly pipeline into Snowflake. Lastly, we got to create an application that suggests how to clump together different vendor names. Sometimes vendors are spelled slightly differently. Sometimes Tech Systems has a space in it, and we want to be able to clump those together as the same vendor. I'd like to invite you to come join us and, and view our poster. Come see if you can find some of the value of data analytics. Next up is Samuel. Thank you, Micah. Hi, everybody. My name is Samuel Blythe. I'll be representing the NetApp team today. I worked with Andreas, Evan, Matthew, and Jacob this semester, and I'd like to thank our sponsors, Randall Everhart, Chris Goucher, and Adam Haywood from NetApp for being here today. So let me tell you a little bit about NetApp. NetApp is a cloud storage provider, so clients pay them to use their data centers and services to host and manage their data. And there's a lot going on inside these data centers. For one, there's a lot of network traffic. You'll see speeds up to 100 gigabits per second. And for two, there's a service they provide called disaster recovery, where if a data center in Charlotte fails, for instance, they can fall back to a data center in Raleigh automatically. Now, so networks or NetApp's software developers need to make sure that the software they deploy to these data centers can handle the high speeds and the long distance communication before deploying it. So how can they do this? What if there were a way that they could deploy two, uh, connect two computers on a line and somewhere in the middle simulate a real-world network with artificial packet loss and delay, something that happens in a real-world network? Well, how would we build this? Let me introduce you to SPADE, the Super Performance Accelerated Distance Emulator. This is what we worked on this semester. So we were approached by NetApp. We were given computers that looked like this one, and they asked us to deploy a software suite that they could use to emulate the characteristics of a real network and test their software de uh, before deploying. So I'm going to break this down for you and show how it works. This box represents the computer you just saw. It's got a 100 gigabit network card. On one port, we're going to have a traffic generator. On the other port, we'll have a receiver. You can think of these as the two computers that the developer uh, is testing the software with. Running on our Spade machine, we have the network emulation software called DMU, which interfaces with a network driver to pull data packets from one port, apply the artificial delay and loss that simulate a real network, and put those packets out on the other port. So that accomplishes the network emulation, but we also developed an API that runs on the server that can interface with DMU to monitor and control it while it's running, and we developed a containerized GUI that NetApp software testers can use remotely remotely to interface with the system. So if you'd like to learn more about how API or GUI were developed, or if you'd like to see the performance testing and results, then come see us upstairs. We'll be giving away sunglasses. So hope to see you there. Thank you. I'll pass it off to Austin. All right. Thank you, Samuel. Hello, everyone. My name is Austin. Uh, I was working on Team 19 along with my teammates, Yumo, Alex, Robert, and Zach. And I'd like to thank our sponsors over at Deutsche Bank for helping us out this semester. So let's get into our problem. Uh, a company like Deutsche Bank uh, accumulates a lot of information. And searching through that much information is pretty difficult, but it's important if you want to get the value out of it. And you'd like to use a computer to do that, but it might not work with the keywords you're searching. You'd like to just give it the gist of what you're trying to find and get the best results. So our solution is to take that information and put it into a natural language processing algorithm. And that will take that and transform it into a bunch of numbers which represent what that information means. And once we accumulate a big list of all of these numbers, we can very easily compare them 
to a number representation of what the user is looking for and find the closest results in meaning. We, we also use Google Cloud Platform, a group of services from Google Cloud allowing us to host a website, store data, and respond to user requests on the internet. And then we can apply that to real world applications like question and answers from FAQs or help desk forums, as well as documents like legal documents where each clause can be represented in this way and searched. And then putting that all together, we get our solution, our expedient just getter using natural language processing on Google Cloud Platform or eggnog. But what exactly goes into eggnog? Rather than milk or eggs, our users come to our React front-end web page where they can make requests to our Python backend, which will pull in all of the data from cloud storage and send it over to our natural language processing, which will transform that into meaning that puts into a big list from Facebook called FICE, and that will very quickly be able to search through those results and return the best ones to the user. And of course, this is all hosted on Google Cloud Platform. So now that you know what goes into it, come try our eggnog. Cheers. And now I'll pass it off to Alexis. Thanks, Austin. Hello, everyone. My name's Alexis, and I'm representing Team 3, whose other members are Cade, another Austin, Pratik, and Dilly. And we're sponsored by the Senior Design Center Director, Ms. Margaret Howell, and her assistant, Dr. Ignacio Dominguez. Oh, and hi, Mom. She didn't think I'd do that. And she definitely didn't think I'd be up here talking to you about calendars today. I mean, we all know what they are. They're that thing that kind of keeps life together. But you don't think I'm qualified to be talking to you about life? Oh, no, no, that's too much work. Austin, go ahead and narrow this down. Austin, what part of too much work don't you understand? Oh, now this, I can get behind this. Because this isn't even my job. It's her job. And every senior knows how important her job is, being the director of our capstone course, AKA the gatekeeper to my diploma. <laughs> so how does she balance the fate of all those desperate seniors? Well, you guessed it through calendars and Google and Word. But what you don't know is that for every single semester, for every single section, for every single event, she has to manually enter a date, time, location, description, and God forbid she makes a mistake. I mean, she's about to catch a felony with all this time she's killed. <laughs> no. Google, you're not cutting it. And before you send your spies up here, I just want you to know, these are just jokes. I'm only getting paid in grades and pizza. <laughs> but my point still stands. Someone needs to help Ms. Howell keep her life together. And who better to ask than seniors trying to graduate? <laughs> yeah, laugh and doubt, but we made the better calendar. I can already hear some of you doubters asking, so how do we access it? Good question. You don't. No, your first job at the audience is to find your local witch doctor and transform to one of our sponsors. We only wanted those gullible, I mean, compassionate enough to put faith in our expertise to have access. But once you do, you can create a calendar through a browser of your choice, which will go through our front end, get processed by our back end, and saved in our database. And then we'll spit out your calendar. And if you create another one, you can synchronize events between the two or even export to one of the following file formats. Oh, and don't worry, Google, we were charitable. We gave you a job and allowed you to synchronize with our calendars. Well, as long as you don't have to drop it like Stadia. But remember, these are just jokes. I would never sit up here and brag about our calendars and bash you in front of all these wonderful people. No, that would just be unprofessional. But I'm afraid that's all the time I have. Dr. Dominguez is going to close the show, but the rest of you will have to simply take this to a Google, 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 wait, Google, wait, we can be faithful. Don't do this in front of my mom. Someone please help me. Miss Howell, help me. That was awesome. Good job. Thank you, Alexis. <laughs> I guess that's what they mean when they say that good developers are being snatched by Google. <laughs> All right, my name is Ignacio Dominguez. I am the assistant director of the Senior Design Center, and I am uh, one of the technical advisors of, of the center as well. I advise one of the sections here. 
So I would like to first start by congratulating our, our, our students. This was an amazing job. These were great presentations. As you can tell, they require a, an amazing amount of work, which is representative of the amount of work the students have put into throughout the semester. And this is possible due to the generous um, time uh, contribution of sponsors. So I would also like to thank our sponsors for, for giving your time and, uh, and expertise and sharing those with, your, with our students and mentoring them along the way uh, by providing interesting projects, relevant projects that are um, you know, very useful for students to learn. So um, at this point, I would like to uh, invite our students, just our students, to get a head start and uh, get their uh, posters set up upstairs in the Duke Energy Hall. So as they do, as they exit, please welcome, uh, let's, let's give them a round of applause. So as students are heading out, I would like to also thank uh, the sponsors of this event, Amazon, the CSC uh, ePartners program, and also the uh, NC State Engineering Foundation for their support and sponsoring this event. I would also like to thank all of you for coming, especially family and friends for, this, for your support of our students. Uh, they, they are really appreciative of you being here and, and providing that support. Uh, I would also like to thank the staff of the Senior Design Center. So we have amazing TAs. We also have great technical advisors. I would like to thank Dr. Card. I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Battistilli, Dr. Sturgill, Dr. King. And of course, I would also like to thank uh, our communications assistant, Dr. Amy Allard. Thank you for, for all your work this semester. And in particular, I would like to thank the director of the center. So a lot of the credit for not just this event, but really the success of our students is to do her hard work throughout the semester. So we only get to work as technical advisors and, 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 and TAs with only one section, but she actually gets to work with all sections and all 24 teams. So that's an incredible amount of work. And, uh, and please, please uh, let's give her a hand because she really deserves all that credit. All right, so this is only half of the event. The rest, the second half is going to happen upstairs in the Duke Energy Hall. So please join me upstairs. You can exit uh, and go up this yellow stairs to the left, or you can also take the elevators further to the left. All right, thank you so much for being here, and I'll see you upstairs. <laughs>